Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are on site in Manchester, New Hampshire at First Robotics headquarters. And we are gonna be talking about manufacturing. We're gonna be talking about automation. We're gonna be talking about the first robotics competition where there are 3,800 teams this year that are competing and building robots and learning a lot together. And they're the future leaders. And I'm super excited to have Frank Merrick joining us, who's the director of First Robotics Competition. Hello. Hello. Thanks for Thanks coming so on the show. Thanks so much for having me on the show. I'm really excited, excited to talk about this. I'm Super always, excited. I'm always excited to talk about first. <laughs> anytime. Yes. yes. And Frank's background is super cool. He's been working in manufacturing, in doing things like procurement, doing things like actually seeing the process out from start to finish of manufacturing all different types of goods from, and this is all the way back from the, you doing work with the United States Air Force. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that was, you know, f that's five years of that. Then there was, you know, five years with Hutchinson. Then it was 10 years with Rockwell Automation. And now it's been almost 11 years with First that's Robotics. Right. So that's this right. is like this is a pretty long period of career leading up to this point. So sure is. there's a lot of nuance to unpack here. Let's so we're going to jump into manufacturing first, and then we'll do some um, first stuff as later on. Okay, most of the time when we look at things around us, I think it's really important to have a lens of awareness to how these things are actually built. I agree. Yeah, a lot goes into this. There's a, an awful lot that goes into this this kind of thing, and I'll tell you when I started my career in when you when you think about it very broadly, manufacturing. You know, you're trying to get to a produce a certain product or a, su or a certain outcome for for uh, for folks. Even when I back when I was in the Air Force. Um, I was responsible for aircraft maintenance, which meant that I was responsible for making sure that the aircraft were ready to fly when they needed to fly. And back then, the, my product was what we called sorties, which is really a fancy word for saying flights. And so we had a certain number of flights that we had to get out per day for training for the, the pilots and so forth. So and you, you had to make sure the planes were ready to go when they needed to be ready to go. So really, in a way, that was a form of production. Uh, after that, I got involved in uh, working for an automotive uh, sealing uh, company. They manufacture like window seals, door seals, that kind of thing for cars. The kind of thing you would never even maybe think twice about, except when something isn't working correctly or got some, you have some, some water coming in. But of course, every single product that's on a car, there's an entire manufacturing process that goes along with that. And for that manufacturing process, you need to procure all the raw materials that needs to come in. You need to schedule the workforce. You need to make sure that the products are going to be where they need to be on time. You need to make sure you have enough inventory to get you through, but not so much that you're sitting on, on a mountain of inventory uh, at the end. So really, all those things kind of tied together. So I did, I did some production scheduling. I was in... Um, uh, procurement, I uh, managed, managed uh, shift operations. I remember when I was working for the automotive sealing company, uh, things that uh, the consumer would never even think about. But we had a, a special type of rubber that we used in the automotive um, uh, seals that was only good between two days after it was manufactured and seven days after it was manufactured. It had this very limited sort of shelf life and it wasn't possible to put it in the fridge. But all of that had to be uh, sort of managed, but it was a it was a a great uh, manufacturing is such a great from my perspective a great uh, career. There's so many things going on all the time, and you're constantly trying to meet deadlines and and uh, trying to work as efficiently as you possibly can. Yeah, this is let's start going all the way back to you know Air Force stuff quick because mm -hmm. this is so interesting. There was like a team of 140 ish people that you were yeah, working with and managing for, responsible sure. for, mm -hmm. and this is really important because we don't typically think of the importance of things being super punctual and like you know if aircraft are needed, they're needed. They they they're needed uh, right away. Yeah, and also. Uh, keeping in mind all the time safety, just like we do at first. Exactly. Obviously, those there are human beings that are gonna be getting on board those, yes. those airplane, and we need to make sure they're maintained and ready to go and ready to fly yes. uh, safely. So it yeah. was, but it was a wonderful. I would, I wouldn't give up my um, experience in the Air Force for anything. It was, it was, yeah. it was fantastic. It really was. And those air, I mean, do, at the scale, you know, we're gonna talk about robot inspection mm -hmm. as well. Sure. But this is 
aircraft inspection is this is these are big this is a big deal these have to be safe there is a ton i mean we're talking dozens if not a hundred or more parts that have to be properly it's it's unbelievable the the um the uh, the young folks that we had working on those planes uh, under the guidance and uh, leadership mentorship really of uh, senior folks just did such a terrific job so dedicated to their to their work and under some some very difficult conditions i happen to be stationed at an air force base in the upper peninsula of michigan where it would get 20 degrees below zero and you still had to go out there and do what you were you were you were, you were needing to do but uh, such dedication on these folks and really exciting as well and then you started getting us uh, deeper into understanding the uh, the uh, in automotive space as well we don't when we sit in vehicles are we really looking around at all of the different knobs and all of the different seals and everything that you uh, everything that goes into an uh, an automobile is designed just extremely carefully tested the type of uh uh, process that we had to go through to get one of our seals accepted by, for example, we did we happen to do a lot of work for GM, we did some work for Ford as well, was just incredible. Even, even you know, the window seals, it's a big deal. You wouldn't think twice about it, but you have very specific uh, specifications that you're trying to make because, of course, the automotive manufacturer is trying to deliver a high quality product to their customers as, as well. And something small like a little window leak, it's kind of a big deal if yeah. you just spent tens of thousands of dollars in an automobile. You don't want to be driving down the highway and just have a little drip coming down. That would be, that would make you crazy. Yeah. And just the, the, the ability to uh, kind of design those seals and have them function as they're supposed to, there's just a lot of work that goes into everything, every aspect of every little device, as you said. None of, the, none of this happens by accident, as, you, as you're <laughs> suggesting here. I mean, just, uh, just every tiny little part is absolutely designed, and there's, there are jobs out there for all those folks that want to do that kind of work, which is yes. another reason why I'm excited to be part of FIRST. Yeah. yeah, FIRST is a very good sort of way for young people to get involved in STEAM careers and then, and then furthermore just they get the emotional intelligence business entrepreneurship all these other sort of teamwork and all this other stuff that um, that launches them forward and into this interestingly enough into certain roles that we're talking about even right now within manufacturing okay I want to I want to highlight where you started going with us in this direction let's talk about anywhere th from um, through Rockwell um, that you've that you've done this Okay, you were indicating like, okay, we have designed something that we want to manufacture. Now we need to procure resources mm -hmm. to manufacture it. We need to make sure we're not sitting on too much inventory. We need to make sure that the operations, yeah, tell us about it, this. Absolutely, and there's so so much of this that sounds sort of very mechanical, but when it comes right down to it, much of it is about relationships with people. Yeah. So we have we certainly have designers working to design all these products and spec them out and so forth. But when you're doing things such as procurement, which just means buying the components, the, the individual components that make up a larger, a larger package, you're talking about negotiations. You have to say, okay, I have certain suppliers that are capable of providing this product. How can I work with them so that they are happy at doing business with us and they want to serve us and at the same time we get uh, decent service at a, at a decent price so we can keep our products as inexpensive as possible, as reasonably possible when we get it to the consumer. And all of that really comes to down to a lot of personal relationships. Yeah. So whereas, so whereas something such as sourcing or procurement can sound very impersonal, it is not impersonal at all. At all. There's always phone calls and video yeah. calls and, and meetings and saying, let's have this relationship because really to, to feel comfortable doing business with someone, you need to have, a, I believe, you need to have a personal connection. I agree. I mean, it's just, it's, yes. it's harder. And, and that's why I think even with things like, um, you look at very what could be considered very impersonal services like uh, purchasing on the web, buying something on eBay or on Amazon or something or something along those lines. Even in those cases, I don't know what your experience is, is on eBay, but if I'm selling something on eBay or I'm buying something, I like to drop a little note to the person and say, totally. "Hey, thanks. You know, how are it? Let me know. This totally. it's going in the mail today, just to let you know. I want to yeah. give you a heads up because exactly. especially when you look at." A situation with eBay where where pers ratings are so important, so important, yeah. so that you yeah. want to have that kind of personal connection. And even that's what you do with the when you're sourcing from a supplier as well. You're building a relationship, and then you're also rating. Oh man, we didn't have a good batch oh, of 
right. supplies that came in from that and, time. And sometimes the, 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 the difficult times really show how, uh, how strong those relationships can be because yeah. things like that happen. Yeah, and then, so this, I wanna, I wanna mention this to you because I, when I read this, I was like mind blown because I remember uh, judging with a, at, at the um, Silicon Valley Regional mm -hmm. uh, a couple years ago with someone that worked at Apple. Mm -hmm. And they did a lot of the uh, relationships for, uh, for the manufacturing of the Apple hardware. And there is a lot that goes into the manufacturing of that and the relationships as you brought up. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> so I started learning from them a little bit. And then it was crazy when I just recently read, it was like a couple of days ago, I read that uh, Apple is United's Airlines' largest client. Apple buys 50 business class flights from San Francisco to Shanghai every single day. Oh, is that right? Wow, that is amazing. Whoa. I had no idea. That Whoa. really is something. Right. And even in, right, even in these days where you could say, well, why don't you just uh, telecommute or, or do it by web? Well, you can, and that helps. But still, getting in a room with someone and making direct eye contact with them, being able to see their body language, being yep. able to shake their hand, being able to go out to lunch yeah. and sit yeah. across from them and, and just share have a, a chat, yes. share a meal when yeah. you're not. Tell me about your life in Shanghai, like it, what's it, going it, on ex here. Yeah. Exactly right. And so many times, I'll tell you, I had this experience when I, uh, over the summer, I traveled to an off-season first robotics competition event in uh, Hangzhou in China. And I, while I had heard about sort of the first robotics competition culture over in China, I had never really experienced it directly. I'll tell you, experiencing it directly was the way to go. Yeah. Because there's only so many times <laughs> you can kind of talk about what things are like. Yeah. But it was just, of course, it was a magnificent, fantastic experience. Um, one I'll never forget, but you, I had to be there. I couldn't yes. just hear someone yes. say, oh, this is kind of what it's like over there. And that first-hand experience of being at a uh, first robotics event in China right. versus second-hand hearing about right. it. or watching it on TV, on TV. or something like it. It's, yeah. still, it's, still, it's still a great way, I mean, uh, uh, telecommunication and, and uh, <laughs> web webcasts and so forth like yours, you know, just has, has come, come such a, a long way since um, just when I was a kid, you know, there, we had got four channels at home, at TV, and that was it. <laughs> and we thought it was a big deal. And they, but, uh, uh, but still, ha still having that interpersonal communication yeah. is very important. I'm really enjoying how important you're making relationships in this dialogue. Um, and I think this is important for, uh, for people to really understand that the human eye to eye and learning about each other's lives and building relationships with all the different people that you work with and caring about them and um, that's how to really build stellar teams, stellar products, build value to other people in the world. Um, I'm, I'm really happy you're bringing that up. Okay, tell us about, an, um, we're gonna, we'll get, we're about to transition to first. I want to learn from you from the 10 years pre-first uh, with Rockwell. Rockwell is a huge partner of FIRST Robotics. Tremendously valuable partner of, of uh, FIRST Robotics competition. We really couldn't do what we do without their support. So I was working at a Rockwell automation f uh, facility um, as I, I, I did some, uh, I did some procurement for them. I also did, uh, uh, I did it was a procurement engineer. I really started as a procurement engineer for them, which is two titles you wouldn't think go together. But in the case, there you're trying to the procurement engineer is trying to sort of translate. Um, be a person within uh, procurement that understands technical details and yes. so can and yes. can go out and buy like technical products whereas uh, a um, maybe a, a, a strategic sourcing person with or a procurement person with less specific knowledge it would be harder for them to kind of to kind of to yeah. do that so that was that was my first job there but eventually I started working for a rock automation facility that was right here in Manchester it's actually right around the corner it's you could walk there in five <laughs> minutes yeah. now that facility has since closed down uh, but it was it was here and I was having a fantastic company to work for great I happened to get I was at the time uh, when I got I got a phone call from a first uh, first robust competition team I happened to be wa working as their uh, manufacturing engineering and quality manager and so a team called up for a local team 
Chaos 131 from Manchester Central High School, and they just asked, they didn't even know my name, they just asked to talk to the engineering manager. Well, because it was a manufacturing facility, I was the only engineering manager in the place, and so I picked up the phone, didn't know, you know, these people, I'd never met them before, and they said, we lost, what had happened to this team is they lost their build site, which occasionally happens. Yeah. Our teams, one of the great things about FIRST Robotics competitions is that the teams often partner with companies, tech companies in the in, in in the field, you know, near the high schools and so forth. They provide them a build space, they provide them with mentors. Well, in this particular case, the company that had been supporting this team couldn't could no longer support them with space, which happens, you know, companies move or they need the space or whatever the situation is. And so it was a cold call. Uh, and they said, we've got this robotics team and we're kind of looking for some help. And I kind of heard about first and Dean came in because being from Manchester, Dean of course is a, just in, in New Hampshire in the world uh, as well now. He's just sort of a big fixture in New Hampshire. And so oh, I, can, I kind of heard about this robotics thing, brought him in, uh, we got him a build space, we found him space in the basement. The, uh, we found him some mentors, we got him from some funding. We actually started to provide uh, some uh, parts to the, yep. the kit of parts. And one thing kind of led to another. I, I just I started mentoring the team. From there, I started uh, I started a couple of uh, first Lego League teams. I started some first Lego League junior teams. This is when uh, your kids were also around that age. Yes, that's right. So they were they were kind of they were they were on the on the on the teams as well. And then eventually, and I was I was so I was just doing a lot of first activities outside my sort of my regular job. And then an opening came up at uh, first World Got Bottles competition, and it just happened to be a fit. They were looking for someone with an engineering degree and an MBA, which I have you know right, and so cool, it just cool. everything just kind of and all and, the experience, uh, and, all the experience yeah, and, yeah. and one thing kind of and it was just yeah. the luckiest phone call i've ever, ever yeah had. yeah and, yeah and you just, that's how this way happens so you, this just, is what you happens, just get lucky yeah. right yeah. random things happen you say wow you know well and uh there seems to be some sort of uh potential essence in the universe that is ethereal that may be helping uh, move along the proper pieces i'll tell you it just it just it just felt like everything just just happened just right but like yeah. i said i just and actually there was even another level to it because i had originally applied to be the uh, first lego league junior director mm -hmm. and they got my resume in and it turned out at the, the time they had they had just filled an opening for a first robotics competition deputy director but it turned out that that person actually backed out, like they'd originally selected someone and they said, oh, we're changing our mind. Mm -hmm. And so the first Lego League junior position had actually been filled and they said, oh, this one's been filled, but we have this other one that just popped up. So it was just an incredible coincidence. One thing led yes. to another, but that's how yes. life works. I mean, yes. you, you, you never know until you get out there and some random things are gonna happen and set you on a lucky path. Yeah. You, yeah. and <clears throat> There's a lot of things that have to happen in order for that to, that lucky path to strike. You get, you got to seize the doors that are opening up and actually walk through them, I, listen to I, mentors. I, There's tons of other things I, that... I, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I happen to have the background they were looking for, the experience that they were looking for, and, and really much of the work that we do here in FIRST Robotics Competition is production-like. Yes, and so exactly. there's a lot of procurement going exactly. on. There's a lot of you have de absolute deadlines that you have to meet. You have to get a certain number of fields out the door on a, at, a, at yeah. a certain time. It's, it's Holy very, cow. very production. We have so much to talk about. Okay, yeah. so all right, let's let's go. Um, you started mentioning this, and we'll kind of transition over with this point that you said. It's as though uh, within the communities where these first teams are, are are spurring up, it's cool how they work with the industries um, in, in, and mentors in their local communities to sort of build up the communities. All of a sudden you have actual um, uh, industry workers that are mentoring the students that are working with them on the different engineering design principles that they need to know on teamwork and business strategies. It's all really exciting. Um, and then that's how you also got involved uh, with uh, bringing them into Rockwell. And that's I'll tell so you great. what we said, what, one of the things that happened to me personally, and we see it reported, Elsewhere is that when when industry mentors, engineers, scientists, technical folks, or really really anywhere, marketing folks, and so forth, because it takes all kinds to, to make a, a good uh, first robotics competition team. It's not just about technical. It's, of course, it's about the soft skills as well as we've been yes. we've been talking yes. about. Uh, a mentor will get involved, and they will suddenly find their day jobs more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, which actually happened to That's me. pretty cool. Yeah, it actually happened to me. I mean, it, it just, I was, you know, I've been at, at Rockwell Automation for, for a period. That, I think that's because you, 
we, we, we so often just go after 22 or 24, whatever, 18 years of learning, we just stop learning, we stop sort of teaching as well. And right. when we have young people that we see their minds being molded into the world and we get to sort of assist, and we learn from them at the same time, that makes it's, us alive. It's a great, it's a great excitement. I would, yeah, absolutely. And that's other people, and this is a common effect, is that you get involved with the first robotics competition team and you may think, oh man, that's so many hours of work. Yep, and I bet you're gonna love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's, there's no question though, it is, it is a great deal of work, but it's, it's work that, uh, I mean, if it, if it wasn't, effective at what it did and it wasn't if people weren't getting something out of it they wouldn't be divide, devoting so much of their lives yeah. their personal lives to yeah. keeping it going yeah there's there's something so important about getting people involved in just going one time to attend mm. uh, first robotics and to volunteer in some capacity especially as a judge is a very exciting way to volunteer and get Absolutely. involved Absolutely, because the, you, this is again this speaks to what we just talked about you get to see young girls young boys building and and uh, skills that are then going to help them so much with their lives and so just being there it, it, is it sparks it, aliveness in absolutely you. and one of the challenges that we have i'm glad you brought that up because one of the challenges that we have within first robotics competition is you you really can't understand it unless you experience it directly it's very hard to sort of yes. capture on tape. You can sometimes capture a little bit as some of the essence, but once you walk into a, a stadium, an arena, or, or even a high school where one of these events is being mm -hmm. held, and you see the excitement and the energy and the absolute passion of these kids, I mean, it's, it's a transforming experience. And, and it really is something that needs to be experienced firsthand to get, yeah. the, to get the full effect. Yeah. Okay, so let's jump because we got a lot to talk about regarding first robotics competition. Okay, so holy cow, there's this, there's this, an, there's an amazing sort of process that occurs behind the scenes every year. Absolutely. In order to actually come up with the design of the competition that occurs, because we all remember the battle bots type stuff mm -hmm. where it's just robots trying to like or, or, or beat each other up in ways. Right. This is this is all about completing objectives on the playing fields that are related to what their a lot of industry is doing. Mm -hmm. This year is a space themed right a game designed for all of the different ages in the leagues. And what's interesting about that is this is the breaking point of the space economy. We're going to space. Sure. And so we're getting them ready to build objectives we're, for space. We're trying to build that kind of excitement and uh, it just so happens that this year of course is the um, uh, 50th anniversary of the first moon landing so everything yeah. kind of ties together <laughs> and so uh the it just so happens first, says, yeah, yeah, right. but they right, talked so about that, this two oh, years been, yeah, ago <laughs> been, yeah so it takes like for example we're working on the 2020 game right now and we've been working on it since last year so 18 month process 18 something, months. something in that something Whoa. in that right 18 months yeah. two years depending on how you think of when it started because we have another concepts that we're yes. we're dealing with but Very really what we do because um Unlike maybe the like, like BattleBots, as you would say, mm -hmm. the first robotics competition and all the other programs in first, uh, first Lego League Junior, first Lego League, and first Tech Challenge, uh, come up with a new challenge every single year. Yes. So the way that we think about it is, we are releasing a new product every year, and yep. for first robotics yes. competition, w that product is going to be released. No matter what else happens, it was going to be the re release the first Saturday in January, and that is an absolute, absolute deadline, deadline because yep. all the teams are getting ready for it. There's no, there's no. Oh, we're going to put on a six-month delay. No, no. Nope. Every you have to, there's, yep. there is no option but to release that yes. game yes. Uh, the fir that first uh, Saturday worldwide, worldwide. simultaneously. Yes. The first week in January, and of course, the game is top secret until until we, uh, you know, yes. it, it comes out. But everything is geared toward all the all the design, all the ideation, working on sort of the the you know the marketing materials, the the um, production. Yeah, most of our production is outsourced. And so it, that means we have to get quotes. We get in our multiple yeah. quotes to make sure to see how we you need know, to find the appropriate folks that could do the metal work for us, and the welders and, and the uh, you know the, the the graphics and so forth. This year, in t uh, 2019, we're going to be sending out over 40 fields of, into 
out for events. We're, we have 175 events that we're putting on this season and 2019. In a couple and, months. And if within a few yeah, months time yeah. sprain, and that's why we need the 41 or 42 fields uh, that, we need, that we need to produce. So uh, in a way, every, every first robotics competition team, as you, I think you mentioned, we have 3,800 in, in about 33 countries uh, this season. Every team gets a kit of parts. And that kit of parts can help set you up for basically what you need to get a very basic robot. It doesn't get you to uh, you know end effectors, manipulators, and all that kind of thing. It doesn't do the programming for you, but you mm -hmm. can build kind of a basic, what we call a kit bot that really is just on wheels and kind of runs around. Every team gets mm -hmm. a kit. In a way, what we do when we produce the fields themselves, those fields are also kitted. Mm -hmm. And we actually have the same organization, a logistics organization that handles the kitting for the the team's kits and also for the field kits. Now our kits are a little bigger. They happen to fill up an 18 wheeler, you know, when they go out from yeah. from from event Is to that event. Andy Mark? That how uh, no. No, okay. no so it's a different it's a logistics organization cool. that's that's closer by um, and they have in aware because the, the, the we got to the point where we could we used to try to do this like load trucks and so forth out of this location. But We've no gone. Way. There's no way this this uh, this building uh, you know was built in the in the uh, 19th century and it just <laughs> yeah, there's not yeah. a lot of sort of dock space or it just yeah. wasn't built for a side of large trucks and 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 high volume. So we had to we had to go elsewhere to kind of find that dock space to make things um, a little easier and more efficient for us. Frank, but let me see if I can let me see if I can uh, come up with a, a synthesis of what's already been said because you're going super fast. Okay, so there's like a almost a two year period that's going into the design of the games. Mm -hmm. And then um, the, what's what's again super captivating about what is being done here with first is just the the, the essence of uh, of, of only a, sh a short build because that's a lot of what goes on in uh, in engineering and in iteration at a lot of industry is that you what is it, six weeks is the build from like the first Saturday in January right. until the middle of February is when they're starting to compete. They're starting to compete right towards the end of February. That's right. And they get this kit like you said, mm -hmm. um, and then they and again this is a big process of the teams is to fund raise money from local industry and community, parents, etc., to be able to afford to participate in the competitions and also to purchase parts through companies like sure. Andy Mark and whatnot. And then also, um, you were you started telling us about the fields, and the fields are designed in a certain way by you guys for the objectives that the robots will achieve to be related to things like programming and mechanical, electrical, computational engineering and design. And then that really helps the kids realize that okay, I'm going to be doing objectives related to sensors, related to you know determining how like the tra doing some calculus with the trajectory of a of 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 a of a, of a of either like one of those wiffle balls, or there's sure. so many cool items that you put on fields. So, so many, so many things important there. So when you think about it, if it's a first robotics competition robot is a programmable electromechanical device designed to accomplish a certain task. Yeah. Well, that applies to just about everything, right? I mean, that's yeah. right. If you think about yeah. it, I mean, there's there's programming in your in your cameras here. Yeah. Yeah. There's software in your, running your cameras. Yeah. Every car has now has whatever it is a million lines of code or something. I heard some crazy uh, amount of, of software that it's like that. so. It's just what they're getting into is just completely ap applicable. Even though, yeah, it looks like they're they're trying to score a ball in, in a hole or something along that. The th all the things that they're learning completely applicable to yeah. the, what is needed in the world to. Day. And of course, the important thing for one of the key important things at first is, is we don't just do technology for technology's sake. Uh, we're, we, we want kids to get involved in something larger than just themselves. When you talk about, for example, the first Lego League project, you might be doing a project about um, generating clean water or keeping the oceans safe yep. or something along those lines. Yep. So we're, we're, we, we don't uh, it's very important to us, and we, we talk about it all the time, that we want, we're hoping our students will take what they learn and get excited about and say, what are the big problems in the world that I can help solve yes. now that I have this inspiration to do more than I thought I could do? Yes. I, I'm really happy that you brought up the fact that every the you you it, you you change 
the designs every year to be related to in to objectives that are also related to like stewardship of earth mm -hmm. and also technological advancement of earth and like eradicating poverty and all these really important um, ways for kids to perceive what they can actually build to solve some of these big problems this is the 30th year that first has been going on there's like i think half a million kids around the world are right. participating That's in first right. robotics total uh, total um at all the program levels yeah over half a million uh, we're going to have something along the lines of 40,000 first Lego League teams, and I don't even know how many countries they have, 80 countries or something. It's insane. It's insane. It's yeah. insane. yeah, and those, and it's really good to get them at the super young age of, of actually one of the, one of, one of these sort of awareness shifts that I've seen in young kids is when they use like, you know, MIT Scratch or when they, when they actually can do something block-based programming wise, and then they let the robot perform, and they go, I, made that happen when they actually design a video game and they have the character do what they asked another one of these is when they look through a telescope and they see the rings of saturn mm -hmm. when there's yeah, a no the first time. when they see that's that for right. the first time because that's when the awareness gets profoundly shifted and there's no going back yeah. i'll tell you what we've what we find we we've actually through we've we've had a number of very uh, generous uh, uh sponsors throughout the year and we continue to have that Partly because they see the value. Now, when we were doing that, we just had first robotics competition had our kickoff for for Saturday in January, and uh, one of the questions we asked a couple of our major sponsors, Rockwell Automation, and uh, Boeing as well, because the season itself, it's uh, our, our first robotics competition game is Destination Deep Space, sponsored by the Boeing company. We said, "What's in it for you?" And they talked about all that, <laughs> those kind of things for you know getting people excited and trying to build a future workforce. Yep. One of the greatest things that we have is, is that we've been working on for years now is we have been uh, 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 having Brandeis University. We've been working with Brandeis University to actually study the effects of FIRST and say how does FIRST, yeah. because yeah. the scientific method, you don't just hope that yeah. something's going to work out, <laughs> you want to check it. Yeah, yeah. And so it, we said we're going to use a little science on ourselves, let's make sure that the things, that, the good things that we think FIRST does for people really does do those things for students. Turns out that it does, which is great news. Yeah. And uh, one of the strongest effects that we see, actually, is on female participants. Yeah. So whereas male participants, they get involved in FIRST, they absolutely do increase their interest in going into STEM fields and taking engineering courses and so forth. Female responds even more so than males. Yeah. It really makes a difference for those. And, and we're, we're, we have we're very focused on increasing minority participation, yeah. female participation, yes, yes, folks yes. that are traditionally upper uh, underrepresented yes. in sort of the, the, the technical fields. Yes. And we, and I'm happy to say that we we do have the evidence now that um, uh, we we really are making that difference. And we're, we're yeah. just we're we're because uh, the future. I'm glad it came out that way because otherwise we could, wouldn't want to be talking about the study. But it turns exactly. out that, right? <laughs> we, we got to actually have the facts and the numbers right. and make sure that this is actually happening. The future is here. It's just not evenly distributed right. and so when you have the opportunity for a kid to potentially use a skill like learning how to program in virtual reality or learning how to make blockchain protocols they're just not exposed to the fact that they can do it yet That's right. and so this is around kids around the world in lower or middle socioeconomic statuses they can actually be pulled up through programs like first robotics and then find themselves earning a hundred plus thousand bucks a year. It, it, absolutely. Yeah. And so that this is the we, case studies. We say it. Uh, we we say it all the time. First is the only sport where everyone can go pro. Yeah. And so there's there's a, really <laughs> any up, participant yeah. on on a first robotics competition or a fir any first team at all, first tech challenge, first Lego league, they can all go pro and do this for a living. And you can't say that about football. There's nothing wrong with football. That's baseball, right. great yeah. activities. Yes. But yes. The kids, number of kids that are going to make a living off of that, tiny. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, almost, there's, almost there's infinitesimal. No, that's inter this is very interesting you bring it up. There's no sort of like basketball or football or baseball, soccer, et cetera, where there, where there's there's only pro and like semi-pro, but there's no like industry-related 
you know, there are some, I guess, you can go and work um, in the different sporting facilities mm -hmm. where you sure. can be pro athlete. Right, right, right. But then, but really, you were, you're bringing this f perspective of like, there's millions and millions of jobs where there's, you know, working in, in robotics or automation or So many jobs. Yeah. We can't, yeah. it's, they can't <laughs> even be filled. I mean, the, the companies that are looking for it, and we had this experience ourselves, looking for folks, not really at the, the first robotics competition <clears throat> uh, levels, luckily, if, when we have openings, we have a lot of very enthusiastic applicants, which is great. Uh, but, um, you know, trying to uh, source, for example, uh, an IT professional, uh, just, it's, yeah. there is a lot of demand yeah. out there, and there are just not enough people to fill all those jobs. And that's what we're trying to fill that, we're trying to create that um, pipeline and fill that gap. Okay, I want to get a little more technical. All right. So this is that this is all extremely important on building the future and have building helping build the youth to care about the future. Um, now I want to do a little technical. Um, you just had eighty robot inspectors that were training here. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, and this is an important um, part of this process: is that the robotic kits that are given to the teams. Then you know they are. You release the game design, so they mm -hmm. now know. Okay, this is what we're com we're building the robot to complete these specific objectives on the playing field that are going to earn us this many points, and they have to keep it in a certain. Um, what is the size again of the first robotics competition robot? A typical dimensions? size would be like uh, about th uh, three feet by three and a half feet, something along those lines. Okay. Maybe sixty inches tall. It changes from season to season based on sort of the needs of the game. Yes. But if you think of, of something maybe the size of a, uh, like a small, like a freezer, like a, a compact freezer or yes, something yes. along those lines, kind of. Like a mini that, fridge. Like a of. mini fridge. Yeah, yeah exactly. Cool. Typically in, in that, Hi, roughly that yeah, size. size yeah. And and for uh, total weight, probably looking at no more than 150 pounds or so, because we have weight yes. limits as well, of course. Yes, so weight limit's 150 about on the that robot, total, and about yeah. a mini fridge or so. Yeah. And then, so now, okay, so now what's happening is not only do they have to fit in the size and weight restrictions, but then the robot inspectors that, you know, that you're training, there's certain, uh, again, if the teams fundraise enough money, which they're totally incentivized to fundraise more money, they can add better and better quality gadgets and gizmos to the actual bots so they can complete sure. those objectives. But then robot inspectors have to come and make sure that the robots are compliant with first yeah, tell us exactly about tell right. us about this. So there's there's a uh, the robotic the robot section of the uh, game manual talks about how the robots puts puts limitations on how the robots can be designed. As we're saying, it has to be a certain size. Uh, this year you can only reach a certain distance outside sort of your the perimeter of your robot. There's a limitation on there. You can't do things like toss certain objects that we don't want to have tossed, like on, on the on the field. Um, and we also many of the rules really are there for. Uh, I would say probably all the rules are for safety and fairness. And so you have to use a certain style of battery. You can't you can't yeah, yeah, it kind of yeah. bring anything you want to use as as a power source. You're limited on terms of the, the types of motors that you can use because we don't, we want to make sure that the robots are not overpowered and uh, to kind of minimize the chance of anyone getting hurt. So, in a, so we, we, all those rules are in place for, as I said, for safety reasons, also for fairness, mm -hmm. because we don't want to, there is a, a sort of a limitation on the amount of money that you can spend on a robot because mm -hmm. we don't, we do want the teams building the robots themselves. We don't want a team going to some uh, manufacturer and say, "Here's twenty thousand dollars. Build me a really nice robot." That wouldn't that would be kind of defeat the purpose, purpose of, of purpose the, of the program. Yeah, yeah. And so, when we have and so teams can think about this as a set of specifications. They're saying, "Here, you could we want you you want to accomplish a certain task. You have to do it kind of within this envelope." Yeah. Just as if you go to a. Um, uh, uh, it, 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 it pick one. You're going to outsource ma manufacturing somewhere, and, and you want to uh, uh, purchase something. You go to the, the possible manufacturing facility and say, "I want it to look like this," or "This this is kind of your limitations. You need to like color within these lines." Mm -hmm. You don't want them coming back and say, "Well, we decided to ignore what you said and just kind of yeah. did our own thing." No, no, that's not that's not how it works. You know, you have we want you to be creative, but within creative within things that keep things in, from a first. Robotics competition uh, 
perspective, uh, uh, fair and, and primarily safe because we're, we're always concerned about safety. Like so, a rover or a satellite needs to fit certain components inside of it, it and certain sizing it, for it, going exactly, up. Exactly, exactly right. They don't have an unlimited weight that they can <laughs> they can ship to Mars, right? There's something, okay, it's got to yeah. weigh this much yeah. or no more than this. Yeah. It's same, it's just the same principle. And then so, there's like the certain ways that they want to potentially analyze the soil composition so that they need the certain tools on board. Right, yeah. exactly. The, the, the same principle. And so here uh, today, we have our lead robot inspectors. There's a lead robot inspector at every event. So every of our 175 events is going to have a lead robot inspector. Yep, yep. Working for that person is a number of other robot inspectors. And their jobs are the teams bring in their robots. And the idea is that they are making sure that folks looking at the robot, doing the inspection, making sure that all the rules, the required rules are Mm -hmm. being followed but it's more than they're not just police right so they'll 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 say is you've got a problem here let's see is there a way that we can work with it you know work it so that we can get you compliant because the goal is to not keep keep people off the field but get them on the field following all the rules yep yep um, you definitely started breaking it down. It's just nuts. The motors, the battery. There's uh, there's a sensor limit as well, r as the right. Is that true? There's no specific sensor limit. Okay. Uh, there are, for example, we talked about there is a dollar limit, like how much you can spend, like on an individual component. On an individual. Because component. we don't, we don't like you said, we don't. So that kind of thing. But really, sensors. That's that's. Yeah. Teams can go those. They can go nuts with. But there is a you know a total dollar limit, so they have yeah, to be careful. Be careful they they, they want to be able to use them in yeah, such yeah. a way that they can. Um, yeah, and the sensor, like, uh, uh, you know, like, obvious, there are some things that are just prohibited, like um, certain levels of lasers, and, you know, we just want yeah. people to be safe. You safe, can't use yeah. grease, you know, that, that kind of thing, because yeah. we don't want to mess up the field. And, All this and, other uh, yeah. yeah. So, you, um, there was also a sort of, um, um, it was really interesting, I believe it was at uh, Stronghold, which Stronghold? was... Three? 2016. Three years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. three, three years ago. Yeah. The, um, it was interesting with that, just with that game design, we saw, well, at least I remember seeing a lot of robots that, that the teams chose to either build and use the 150 pounds and use the three foot by three foot sort of mini fridge style size, yeah. or some went really thin. Very, very low. On the ground, very right. low, like we're only talking this high. Yeah, so, right. So they get to pick and uh, right, yeah. and so and so that was that was a specific reaction to something that we had put in the game, which we called the which was called the low bar, and so yeah, yeah. what teams found was that there was an advantage to you going under that low bar, yeah. and then they would go under it, and then after they got past it, they would pop open. Open. They would open. They would. And that's open how they up. would shoot the projectiles into. A, 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 yeah. Right, and so yeah. a lot of a lot of teams did that. Now that's of course that's that's a design trade off. They're it's saying it's cool. Yeah, I want, it's cool. Yeah. It takes maybe a little extra work to be able to kind of go compact and then go out yes. and pop uh, pop open so that but that was one approach that many teams did so we, we try to put uh, challenges in the game as best we can so there is no obvious solution yes like there are trade-offs everyone to yeah so that's actually a really good point is that the more that you put interesting design trade-offs in the more crowdsourcing of good ideas can come, sure. yeah, that tackle the objectives in different ways. Yeah, we have, we see so many, and many teams uh, publish information about their progress. Yes. So say, hey, we're working on this, or we're doing this. Uh, there's even a group, uh, or a group of, of uh, folks that put together a challenge, um, what they call the Robot in Three Days project. Yeah. Well, they will, they will uh, mentors, uh, uh, typically some students as well, but they'll try to test out some concepts, try to, try to finish a robot actually in three days. And this is this is the very cool that um, when when you this is like a hackathon for yeah. for a robot for first and what's good about that is when you have this sort of like you set a conscientious deadline three days then you work really hard with a group of people with teamwork and with operations and manufacturing engineering design prototype etc you get it done not only does it feel tr really good to be able to say that you've done things like that but then you realize kind of what. Um, industry like you know hackathons and processes oh, sure. are you you know this six week time crunch you give this is for specifically first robotics competition first tech challenge first Lego League first Lego League Junior have longer sort of builds and periods of time to yep that's right and actually we're making a uh, a change to this um, whoa where we have had we have been first robotics competition has been the only program in first of the four programs that had a specific build deadline yeah the other 
programs, you would you could build into a competition. The yeah. deadline yeah. was when you need to put the robot out on your first match. That was that was the deadline. We spent a great, and we still have that for 2019 season. Six weeks is still the limit. We made a significant decision. We've actually been working on it for a few years now. Mm -hmm. That starting in 2020, there will be no stop build day. So you are Whoa. still under yeah major change yeah. Uh, for us and for the and for the community. Yeah. And uh, uh, you still of course you still have a deadline. The yeah. deadline is when are you going to be going to your your first competition? Sure. And I'll tell you the reason why we made this change. Yeah. The primary reason. We have spent a lot, a lot of time uh, in the last few years working on uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And when we looked at the Stop Build Day through that lens, there are other lenses to use to kind of look at the different ways to look at it, but when we looked at it through that lens, we recognized that many of the top teams, probably most of the top teams, not exclusively, but almost certainly most of the top teams, actually build two or more robots. Oh, yeah. So they, they will have build enough money Right. To be able to spend in that dollar limit that you have on one robot, they can do that multiple times. Uh, right, because the the dollar limit is on your competition robot. On your competition and, robot, and yeah. what you need to bag up, you when you what you there's a, a point when you when it's time for stop build day, we would put the robot in a bag and say I'm not touching it again until competition. Well, <laughs> teams that are that are well resourced yeah. would put that one robot in the bag. And then keep working on the other robot. Yeah. And one of the one of the advantages that multiple robots has, for example, and this it probably is not immediately obvious, is you can continue to work on software and that kind of thing. But also you can get in drive practice. You can get and in so drive driving practice. driving skill is so important to doing well in our competitions that often can can kind of make the difference. So you had yeah. teams with more resources that were out there driving away, where teams that um, yeah yeah and with limited resources, under resource teams that got their sad robot sitting off in a corner in a bag, and they're like, well, what do, what we, do you do? There's now? nothing. We Before can do. competition, right? There's nothing. Can, you, there's nothing you oh, can do. And there's and also so the resource. Um, have the resource set. Uh, teams can also then have things like their own practice fields, or ex ex things like that. Exactly or, right. And then they all can also do things like they can use um, a, a robot on the on the field that can potentially can they. Could they use a different, no, they can't use the other robot. No, they have, yeah, so the other robot is really just like a practice robot, but we did have some rules yeah. allowing, like uh, bringing in a certain amount of additional weight or, or swapping out components, components and that kind of thing. Oh, that interesting, yeah. So that where, whereas you do have one competition robot that you enter in, in, in in uh, each event, this is a but those rules are going away. It's, it's a very significant, a very yeah. significant cultural change for us yeah. because we so long have been doing it uh, with a limitation. But when we looked at it, getting serious about equity, diversity, inclusion, we looked at it and we said, "This is the right change for, not without its downsides, no question." And we heard a lot from the community. Uh, some saying this is great, some saying, "I, I." This is too much. I can't because there's some value in have, having sort of an imposed limitation it's on how much you're working. And right. deadline, yeah. Because it, we because now they can tweak it all the way up to competition, right? And so they they might be. Whereas, uh, oh, so yeah. whereas you know, if you're you're the spouse of an FRC, or first robotics competition mentor, you may have been able to say, okay, this is only for I'm, it's only for six weeks that I won't be see seeing her, you know, because she's off doing the robot thing. Yeah. Where I'm back, you know, whatever this, the situation would be, yeah. uh, uh, she's off doing. I don't see her, but now they're saying, well, now you're extending that time. But, but the, oh, but what we're the approach that we're taking is that this puts scheduling in the hands of the teams. They are completely making their own decisions. So if they wanted yeah, to, yeah. if they really, a couple ways to approach this, if they wanted to, they could they could say, um, probably a way we would not suggest, but they could say, I'm going to work as hard for for ten weeks as I'm doing for six weeks. That sounds like a recipe to burnout for burnout to me. But they might make that choice, mm -hmm. or they can say, I'm going to take the amount of work I was doing over six weeks and spread it out over ten weeks. Yeah, so yeah. instead of a yeah. five day a week activity that I have, it's only a three day a week and I might be able to, that might lead to I could play a uh, different extracurricular at the same e time, ex music or sport or other exactly things. Exactly yeah. right, that's because cool. we have, especially for uh, students, and that's a great point about students as well, of course, is that their participation in first robotics competition or any of our programs is, of course, competing with a thousand other things that they could be doing, yeah, including yeah. sports and music and all that, which all we, we encourage. encourage we, totally. want, 
yeah. well-rounded students. We don't yeah. want them just doing robots. That doesn't. It's yeah. not going to lead to a good outcome for anyone. Multi yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's not going to be a lead to a good outcome you, for anyone. You know, another huge principle of what you're teaching us right there is that now it levels out the playing field in terms of now the teams can work on the robot and practice with the robot leading up to the competitions instead of just a the resource wealthy ones could abs practice Absolutely and right. And so yeah. because as you pointed out, uh, some of our teams have like full full fields or something similar to a field and now yeah. they can invite other teams and say come on it's open all the time there's no restrictions you don't have to worry if you have just one robot you could still go practice with go it practice with after it. that what would be a traditional interesting six -week there's build. also going to be a lot of time that they can then um, you're you're adding time then for them to be able to learn and iterate as well which is cool so it's, it's actually opening it's things so, up quite it's a bit so it's the iteration is so important yeah now if you ask me what the kind of what the practice effects are going to be we're going to find out because human nature being what it is it wouldn't surprise me if many teams are still scrambling at the end of you know the day before the competition still, as they used to scramble totally, before totally. Totally. <laughs> right but at least yeah. at least but if they're in that position you know maybe they they didn't have to worry about so much scrambling um, uh, early on or but teams can take it really any way they want they could say you know what? we're not really going to start working on the robot until two weeks into the season so yeah. it'll still be a six-week build but we're just going to it, it's really it's putting uh, teams are more in charge of their own destiny now yeah and and honestly uh, you know some teams are just they would rather there's there's some sense that maybe they would rather have first say no here's your deadline yeah rather than going the other way but I think yeah. overall yep. it's going to be a great move yep yep I think so too and it's really good to to all to there used to be this, you need to b b bag it up and seal it and you know, so have many to rules. do so many rules. And so, yeah, so, it's kind of nice to right. Yeah, open I just, I'm telling up. you, and one of the things that we're trying to do is, is long term reduce the complexity of first robotics competition because there's still a lot of rules. Yeah. But <laughs> getting rid of, we're doing our best, but, but getting rid of uh, uh, stop build day and all the rules yeah. that go along with it, that's a whole set of rules that. Phew, phew, we don't have to, yeah. you're no longer going to get penalized. Opening things up for kids to participate in other things, put right. ma uh, do additional build time, spread out the build time. It's right. very interesting stuff. Yeah. More iteration, they can drive more. And the it's reason cool. we, we announced this, um, I think in October or November, but anyway in the fall, for 2020, yeah. because we wanted teams to take this season to think about, the 2019 season, to think about how they run the teams, what's important to them, which way they want to go because yeah, it's so true. it is yeah. so easy in first robotic competition in life to just get into a rut well yeah. we've done this it's yeah. worked for the last 10 years we'll do the same thing again yeah, well yeah. and now we're saying no no i mean really think yeah. about it you may want to do the same thing again but take a breath to say okay yeah. i yeah. now have this uh, the landscape has shifted formulaic change right think about cool. it think about what's important to you and what's the best way to reach those goals yes. now that you have uh, a longer sort of span of time to do it? You, and you yeah. may do exactly what you were doing before, but, totally. uh, but I think that many teams will look at it and say, oh, we can do things a little differently. Maybe exactly. we can do things with less stress and we can sure, still sure. kind of achieve our objectives. Okay, let's talk on um, culture because this is really important. There's, a, there's this first robotics culture of gracious professionalism. We just had Woody Flowers on the show and there's a cooperation. This sort of idea of being graciously professional so that you can, ex you can express a great amount of love and compassion for other people and other teams uh, with providing parts or providing yes. help and guidance, mentorship, but still compete right. on the field. That's such a beautiful way of seeing the world of how we can work together. It's, it's, and I think that it's something that is fairly unique to FIRST ro Robotics Competition, to all the FIRST programs uh, as well, because all the programs have that gracious professionalism built in. The idea that you can, as you said, you can compete while still being compassionate towards your yeah. opponents yeah. now this is probably not the kind of thing that you might see in NASCAR or in you know, <laughs> you know, know. Yeah, so I'm trying to imagine yeah. I'm trying to yeah. imagine I mean it's not um, I know you've been to, to many events you've seen it it's not unusual for someone a, a team to tell the uh, 
announcer in the pits, we're missing this part or we're missing this tool, the announcement goes up and, and 10 different teams will come running over to try to help yeah. to say, here's a tool. Can you imagine like an, in a NASCAR situation sure, sure. where some NASCAR team says, I'm missing this tool and the other NASCAR teams are coming around. Now, maybe yeah. they would. I don't yeah. know. I don't know how that would work, but I think it would be rare. It's like a shift to an abundance mindset on the planet rather oh, than the scarcity absolutely. one. And we see things, for example, um, uh, like the pie it, is growing for everyone absolutely. instead of I have to it, keep. See, so first, robotics competitions still want to win, but they want to win against opponents that by doing their best against other teams that are also doing their best. Yeah. And sometimes you need to help those other teams, teams do their do best. Their best yeah. uh, you know, off the field is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. But, yeah. it, but, but and also like, but there have been times like during during matches where. Um, an alliance, this, this happened in a finals uh, event recently, I can't remember where it was, where an alliance recognized that another alliance needed to take a timeout, but they, that other alliance had already used their timeout. So the first alliance took their timeout so that the other alliance could have more time to get their robot up and running. I mean, when would you... Gracious When do you see that? Yeah, yeah, that's what I believe, because you, yeah. you don't want to win because the other guy had a broken robot. Exactly. You want to, you want to do well. You want to do your best while, while, while competing against them. That's all doing their best. best. Yeah, yes. or sharing components. Or, it's just it's so important to us. And the culture, I mean, we've been around, you said we're, we're, we're going on... Um, uh, th first itself going on for 30 years, and certainly first robotics competition 26, 20, I don't know what the, the total number is right now, but um, something around 26 years. But the uh, 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 we've had this, people are so fanatic and engaged, many people, with first robotics competition. You can really engage it at any level you want. You can just go to a competition and check out a competition and yeah. have a lot of fun. We get Absolutely. like a lot of a lot of uh, parents doing that that kind of thing, yeah, engaging yeah. at that level. Yeah. You can get much, much more engaged. Involved, yeah. We have, uh, for example, I'm not sure if you're aware, there's been a tradition going on at Championship where there's a robo-prom. Yeah, there's yeah, actually a prom cool, yeah. that goes on <laughs> at Championship and now at both locations yeah. a team puts on a prom, they do it for fundraising for themselves to raise money for the yeah, following yeah. season. They sell out every year, they have a yeah. thousand attendees, everybody goes and has a blast mm -hmm. you know, at, the, at this prom. It has nothing, first headquarters had nothing to do with or it's just happening on its own. And, it, it, and, one, of, and one of the reasons why is not only to build the culture within mm -hmm. first and the, and the teams but also because sometimes they have to miss their, their proms due to the championship competitions sure. yeah right and that was I think that was originally the, the, yeah. the how that was kind of kind of uh, started yeah. up but yeah, it yeah. was it was just but it's been going on for years and this now. is so cool these little additions of culture we, building we have a number of different um, webcasts that go on they have nothing to do we have we don't produce them it's just yeah. individual yeah. groups saying we want to have a webcast like yeah, what sure. happened in first is let's have a webcast like do a show exactly. and get some experts on exactly. yeah, and yeah. talk about it there's even a you've heard of fantasy football mm -hmm. there's a fantasy first league that's where you so could go funny. and pick teams. That's so that, funny. Yeah, no, it's insane. That's so funny. It's, yeah, it's, it's oh insane. Now it's not people like a thousand people are participating in that. But now, yeah. that's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, funny. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. But people take it and they run with it because there are all these different aspects of, of first, not just about the robot. Yeah, correct. More than robots. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, Okay, on the way out, I want to ask a couple questions. Um, you kind of started indicating towards this, um, towards this, the competitions that are played at these 175 <laughs> events that are yeah. going to be played in just a couple months, in like three months mm -hmm. um, or so. And that's just for first robotics competition. Then there's all the thousands, the tens of thousands, thousands of other of, teams oh goodness, that yes. are being played in the other leagues. Now, they're sort of this, um, they, they win at these events, and the ones that win the different awards, there's, there's different awards that are won. There's, you know, Inspire Awards that are mm -hmm. won, or Chairman's Awards that are won, there's Motivation Awards, right. or Engineering Notebook Awards, right? There's these sort of different um, awards, and these, winning these awards is kind of what gets you into the next step and gets you closer to the championship round. And Typically, now, you, right, yeah, yeah, yep. And then you have you went from having a single championship. Um, now we you went have to two championships because there's so many teams. I'll tell you what the the reason, the big impetus for that is. Our championship is the first championship is a little bit different at, than other sort of sports championships. So we, it's it, experiencing championship is so overwhelming and and meaningful for so many of our students. We wanted to make it more available, yeah. more broadly available. So as at the first robotics competition level, um, 
we went from, we had about, I think it was maybe we had 600 teams or something like that before we went to the two championship. Now we have uh, two championship locations, uh, first championship Houston, first championship Detroit, both of which have 400. So that means we can get 800 teams, about a little more than that, at these events that have these teams experience this. Yeah. And um, we, we want to make that experience unforgettable. Yes. And the, the for example, uh, last year, between the two locations, we had a total of 70,000 people attend those championships, yeah. which is a huge number. So and you walk yeah. into this, this huge Convention activity, center, and you are just, yeah. especially if it's your first time there, you're absolutely blown away. Blown away. Yeah. But we are a little bit different in that um, you don't, to get to championship, you, the, your only path is not... I'm trying to figure out how to, how to put this appropriately. You cannot win an award and still get to championship mm -hmm. because we have what we call waitlist slots. And mm -hmm. for us, that's a very important part of the experience. We really want, because with the level of competition there is a first, first robotics competition and the wide variety of resources and so forth that teams have available, we don't want to say to any team ever, your chance of getting to first championship is zero. I'm really sorry. So we always want to have at least a non-zero chance. Now the chance might be very small, but we want to have a non-zero mm -hmm. chance of those teams being able to get there. Yeah. And so uh, this year, uh, for, for 2019, I'm not sure what the total is. We'll probably have between, at each location, probably between 30 or 40 or so, something in that range of waitlist slots, where teams that want to go, they just say, you know, put me on the waitlist for championship. And we actually have a weighted lottery system that we use to select those cool. teams. So the longer that you have been a team since the last time you made you it to made championship, it to Good. You get your number tossed in the electronic hat that many times. So if you haven't been to champs in 10 years, your electronic number gets tossed in 10 times or whatever the count yeah, is. Yeah. Whereas you went last year, you wouldn't have as, you know, as, the, as much of a chance a, there. There's, a, there's, a, there's, there's some, a couple things to measure there. I mean, one of the things to measure is, of course, the benefit of having uh, teams that didn't win awards, 10 championships. There's mm -hmm. a lot of potential benefit there. Yeah. There's also the kind of like benefit of of in of enticing them to potentially you know strategize and work harder to win awards so that they don't just it, rely on a wait list it, there's it, also absolutely. you don't necessarily want to go to champs and then get crushed by other right. yeah, part, yeah <laughs> competition it's, so, there's there's yeah. a lot there is a lot that that goes into that and we find a championship just to be from what we've reported from the teams, just very inspiring. Yes uh, for every yes. team that goes and we say uh, you know um, Every team that going to championship, every team, every team going to championship probably doesn't deserve to win. There's no team I know of that does not deserve to be inspired, and totally. so we want to make that. We That's a good way to put it. That we want to yeah. make that possible. And yeah. at the same time, we talked about because um, every, no matter how we structure the rules, no matter how big the tournament, the particular event is, or how small it is, there is always somebody. There is going to be teams that are in the bottom ten percent. Of the rankings, well, yeah. no matter how great so they are, the harder great they are. Yeah, <laughs> so, totally. So and yeah, so, what we try to do, and this this is a phrase that actually came from uh, one of the first Lego League um, engineers, is kind of the back on the bus experience. So, we want every team that goes to an event when they get back on the bus to say that was worth it. I yes. can't. I, I'm, yes. I, even totally. if even if they're nothing worked on the something, we try to give them something that they can hang their head on. Our, a robot finally, you know, completed a full match yes, without, right? yes, whatever yes. that is. We want to give them some legitimate win, not just a kind of a, a pump up win, a, a, a talking totally, about a win, but totally. a legitimate win that they can point to and say, "We did. We accomplished this this one task. We didn't do great in the rankings. You know what? Next year yeah. we're kind of going to come back and we're going to do better." That so that's kind of the goal. Of inspiration a little is bit of so legitimate crucial. thing that they can point to and say, "We got it's this crucial. done." That the tiny bit of additional drive that someone can feel from accomplishing something or hearing the good job from right. someone else, that yeah. is a huge motivator to drive forward. So that happening at all levels of participation mm -hmm. is really, really crucial, but also um, to open things up for people that may find themselves potentially uh, deciding to want to endeavor into something else because they may not be uh, find themselves uh, so good at a certain aspect sure. of things. Okay, let's let's do we do a couple normal questions on the way out of our shows, and I'm excited to um, hear some of your thoughts about them. 
Um, okay, one of the questions that I'm finding interesting to ask people is about forces that sort of transcend the human experience. So some people reference God, some people reference all that is, some sort of cosmic or universal spirit, something that's past the three-dimensional reality. What do you think transcends us? That's a great question. I find that I have had, I'll tell you about a transcendent experience that I had in, in first in, and what it was what it was like and it really it was legitimately for me uh, transforming. So I had, <clears throat> I had been mentoring a, a first robotics competition team for a few years. I had a rookie first Lego League team in a town nearby my home. And we worked really hard with this team, rookie team. First, first, their first year, everyone's first year in the organization, we went to a local competition, and I think there were like 15 teams there. It was actually at the University of New Hampshire over in Durham, New Hampshire. And uh, during, the, during the event, they were doing, of course, the first level, you know, it's a single day kind of event, and there, as you know, there's a number of, you know, uh, judging sessions that you go to. We were doing pretty okay. Like, it was, you know, I thought it was going okay. We're doing okay on the table. We're doing okay in the, the judging sessions. And at the end, we got to the awards. And uh, we went through, they started going through all the sort of the awards that they were giving out. And they went through the technical awards and we didn't win anything. And they went through the, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, project awards and we didn't get anything. And they went through the good and we didn't get anything. And so in my hot mind, I was actually rehearsing a little script that I was going to say to the kids to say, you know what, you get, we didn't win any awards. It's not important we learned. it's about the experience we yes. learned yes. it's your first year i could see that you guys were having fun and so we're going to come back in it and then they got to the uh champions award which is the top award for for the uh, first lego league and they started reading through it and and um i i started to get just i they were they went through this this you know description Script. of the award yeah, yeah. And, and so forth and then the and literally, are literally, playful. I yeah. was I, literally, I was in my mind. I was at that moment practicing what I was going to say to the kids. Yeah. And they said our name. Yeah. <laughs> and so I great. had, I was sitting down. I literally, I got dizzy. I mean, I'm not kidding. I got dizzy. If I had been standing up, I would have fallen over. I could not <laughs> believe it. And at that moment, I had because I, I realized I had kind of set up a little wall in my mind about between between you know, what was possible and what was impossible with, with students of this age. And that emotion that I expect was experienced, I think, was that wall just being wrenched from its foundations. And suddenly for me personally, it was like, yeah. this is fantastic. And it's that kind of, for me, that was a, a transcendent experience. And we see that all, oftentimes in first robotics competition. I'll be walking around the, the pits and I'll be talking to a I'll be talking to a student, this happened to me several times, I'll be talking to a particular student on a team and they just seem really excited and know, they know all their stuff and they know what's going on. And then later on in the ceremony, they'll be announced for Dean's List. And it's like, this is fantastic. Yeah, so for me, right. it's those kinds of, Moments, uh, yeah. I, can't, I can't really explain I that moment either. or logically true. how that happened, but I'll tell you, the I feeling. was legitimately... I was legitimately ready. I was dizzy. I'm not making that yeah, up. Yeah, I was like yeah. sitting down. I was especially I when you're getting breathe. ready to get I was the ready script. To, to, to say to say, uh, hey, it's, it's okay, okay if we, we don't learn. win anything. And then they win the and then they win the top award. award. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it was just and um, boom, just a great and what how, transformational for these kids. I've never seen kids so excited. Exactly. Oh my gosh, it was just it was it was really it was transformational. I'm glad, I'm glad you brought your experience with that up. Uh, I've had a, also a similar experience of an all-girls uh, first tech challenge team that won the Inspire Award, mm. and uh, when and that was my first time judging. And yeah, yeah. when and when I when I you know when they're running through high fiving, I'm like tearing oh, up. Oh yeah, I'm, it's so you know, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, like 13 yeah. to 17 year old girls are just like, they know so much more about engineering and designing right. robots than I do. Right, I'm like, yeah. awesome. Yeah. How do we, yeah, how do we get this around the world That's more? Fantastic. So I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, okay, this wouldn't be simulation if we did ask you. Do you think we're in a simulation? Boy, that's a great question. I guess I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I wouldn't know on that. And it, it's, it's, actually, it's actually funny because I was just thinking of um, when I first became um, 
director of first robotics competition because I was deputy director for a while and I became a director and I saw a comment on one of the message boards that said something about uh, not sure if if I was like my person was like a construct or something that like marketing had invented or, or something <laughs> like they created this personality or something and I, I posted a blog saying hey I saw these I said to the best of my knowledge I'm a real person but I posted to the yeah. I, I, I linked it to the uh, um, you know, you've heard brain in a vat right yeah. and yeah. so I've yeah. linked I linked to the brain in a yeah. vat yeah. entry on Wikipedia so sure, that you can yeah, take sure. a look to see sure that, that. Yeah. Yeah. So to the best of my knowledge I don't think this is a simulation but I guess I guess it's not outside the realm of possibility. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's such a good thought experiment, and yeah, uh, yeah I feel like I'm constantly leveling up, <laughs> leveling up in a game, right. and and I Excellent. and I love I love uh, doing the hard work to level up, gain the experience points. Oh yeah, something we talk about a lot on the show is making sure that the next generation of of leadership is striving to be their best selves in the world. We need it, them. It, it, absolutely, especially with when you, you look in the culture, I'm sure every generation probably says this, but you, you look at it, uh, a culture and the way the culture is, is going right now, and you just get the sense that many folks are just kind of hoping that good things happen to them. You know, by, by like, versus by actually like, seizing by the opportunities actually, and by going, actually going the doors. out and, and working and, and working and for it. And then it's also up to us, not only for them to you know work really hard in the communities to help oh. um, with, but then but then it's also up to us to do things like help with the planetary design and architecture, where the resource flows and frameworks for all people. The baseline is constantly increasing, so that people have maximal degrees of economic freedom to pursue what actualizes them. I, I, I agree. And, yep. and, and one other element of that is uh, from a, within a first robotics competition standpoint, of course, is mentoring is so important. Yep. It's just a critical part of the program. Yes. And it really, it, it uh, really transcends showing uh, students how, to, how they might want to put together a, a, a robot. It's about helping them win at life, not just yep. win in matches. Yes. But saying, look, you, you got to go out and you know what? You're going to have to do some things that you may not want to do. Yeah. But that's how you, you, you Learn and get grow. ahead, right? Yeah, yeah. And you make yourself, it make it so much easier on you in the long term if you, you do um, some, some of those hard things yeah. up front. Yeah, face sure. adversity and learn and grow and yep. get through it. Um, this has been super enlightening. Super enlightening. Talk, Thanks man, so talk much. about manufacturing. Thanks so much for having me. Talking about the complexity of that. Oh, talking yeah. about first robotics competition and all the complexity in that as well. This has been a lot of fun, Frank. Yeah, Thank you so for much. me as well. Thank, Thank you, you so I'm much. Thanks for having time. me on the show. Glad you had a good time. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear from you. Give us your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. And if you're interested in the first any programs at first, we have programs from uh, 6 to 18 years old. Please go visit www.firstinspires.org. Check us out. And we've got all kinds of, we've got, we got something that'll work for you. Firstinspires.org, links in the bio, check it out. Like we talked about in the episode, even that tiny bit of volunteering and seeing how children's minds are being molded through things like this in the world is super enriching. Go and check it out. Um, and let us know your thoughts. And thank you very much for tuning in. Build the future, manifest your destiny into the world, everyone. Much love, and we will see you soon. Peace. That was Great. so fun. All right. Thanks. That Thank was you. good. Thank, Thank you. you. That was a lot of fun.